Zoda's Revenge, Star Tropics 2, is one of the most epic sequels on the NES. Unlike most other video game sequels that create a new storyline so that new players won't feel lost, Star Tropics 2 not only assumes players are familiar with the original game, but have fully completed it. Zoda, the titular villain, only appears in the final chapter of the original game, and characters like Micah, a friendly alien girl, were only revealed during the ending cutscene. This is awesome for fans of the original, but severely limits the game's audience. People that enjoyed the first game but never finished it aren't even going to know who Zoda is. Zoda's Revenge was developed by Nintendo's Integrated Research and Development Division and was the brainchild of Genyo Takada, one of Nintendo's greatest developers. Takada had designed Punch-Out! as well as the original Star Tropics. He always felt strongly that the North American market had a ton of untapped potential. Most video games at the time were developed for the Japanese audience, then translated to English. That worked fine, but it was difficult to write a good story that would translate well, especially one with comedy elements. Takata hoped that American gamers would be excited to play a game made just for them, full of cultural references they would appreciate. After completing Star Tropics, which was fairly successful, Takata already had ideas for a sequel. This time, instead of an island hopping adventure, Protagonist Mike Jones travels through time and is aided by famous historical figures like Leonardo da Vinci, King Arthur, and Cleopatra. The time traveling gives some nice variety to the chapters which feel much different from the islands of the original. The gameplay is mostly the same as in the first with one major change. Mike is no longer locked into a grid and can now move diagonally. This control scheme feels much less rigid, although it's not as precise. There are also 3D elements that allow Mike to climb up to higher tiers within the rooms. Zoda's Revenge ended up being the very last game Nintendo developed exclusively for the NES. When it finally released in 1994, the Super Nintendo had been out in North America for almost three years, and there wasn't a lot of interest in games from the last generation. It ultimately didn't sell very well, and the series quietly died. While it's very sad that we never got to see what kind of awesome adventures Mike Jones could have gotten into on the Super Nintendo, this game is truly excellent. It didn't make it onto IGN's list of the top 100 NES games of all time, but I have to speculate that their editors just haven't played it. As you would expect from such a late release, this game really takes advantage of the full potential of the NES and is a masterpiece that shouldn't be missed by anyone that enjoyed the original. Modern players that attempt Zoda's Revenge will still have to deal with all of the challenges the NES is notorious for. There are plenty of platforming challenges that can lead to instant death, the levels are loaded with devious traps, and many of the bosses can be quite difficult. But what if I told you where to find tons of hidden medicines, big hearts, and weapons, so you'll always be ready for the next challenge? What if I told you about secret shortcuts that can allow you to skip difficult sections, or even entire boss fights? And what if I told you how to beat all of the game's challenging bosses? Even Zoda himself? Well, on today's episode of You Can Beat Video Games, we'll learn all of that and more. If you're new to the channel, we're doing deep dives on retro video games and giving you the professional strategies that can be used by the casual gamer. Please make sure to subscribe and click the bell for notifications so you don't miss any new episodes. Let's get started. Alright, Zoda's Revenge. You don't have to have finished the first game to be able to appreciate this one, 
but you may be a bit lost as far as the story is concerned. If you need to catch up, you can always check out my episode on the original Star Tropics, which is available on the channel. And here we are in Chapter 1. Chapter 1 only contains story elements. There are no adventure scenes in this one. Since we last left Mike and Dr. J, they've been trying to solve the cipher on the alien spacecraft. I'm not sure why they haven't been working directly with the alien children. You'd think they would maybe know something about it. But they're not, and that's why Mike receives a telepathic message from Micah. She had a dream where her father told her, Was it a cat I saw? Was it a rat I saw? A strange clue, but those sentences are palindromes. They can be read forward and backwards the same way. Mike will bring this information to Dr. J, and using it, they'll finally be able to solve the cipher. According to the instruction manual, Dr. Jones believes that the answer to the puzzle lies in a strange book called the Oxford Wonder World. It seems like a regular old encyclopedia, but according to the manual, this is not something you can just buy in the store. It was gifted to him many years ago by a very wise old man. Whenever they read the cipher backwards in front of the book, it seems to activate it like a magic spell. The book cracks open, the pages start flipping, and suddenly Mike is transported through time. And here we go. It's time for Chapter 2. Chapter 2 takes us to the Stone Age, and it's unclear whether we're actually traveling through time, or if we're traveling into a world created based on the information in the book. The more I play the game, the more I think it's the latter, but it is open for interpretation. As we come up here, this caveman tells us that there are many holes in the ground ahead, and if you want to avoid them, follow my instructions exactly. Follow along the right side, but before you get to the tree, go left, then up, then left, three spaces, then up, and then all you need to do is go left two, down one, left two, down one, left two, down one. The end part is very easy, it's all left two, down one. If you do fall into one of these action scenes, they're random and they can be slightly different, but they're all pretty similar to this one. Here you can grab the rocks weapon, which is the weakest weapon in the game and only does half damage, but you can get a good appreciation for the 3D elements. Look how far you can jump when jumping down from a very high area to a very low area. You don't need to kill the enemies here to move forward, so just try to get out as quickly as you can, and you'll be returned to the map screen. On the other side of the snowfield, we'll come to the Caveman Village. Life has been tough in the Stone Age, and I'm talking tougher than usual. After talking to a few villagers, we'll get the impression that something very bad has happened to the children around here. This guy by the pile of bones is named Tink, and he gives us our first standard weapon, the axe. Tink's axe is sort of the equivalent of the yo-yo in this game. Tink is the only caveman that you're required to talk to. Unlike in the original game, we don't have to speak to all of the villagers to move forward here. Although we may want to talk to some of these cavemen because they offer us valuable clues. If you come around this way, we'll encounter an artist named Picasso, an obvious reference to Pablo Picasso. He doesn't say anything, but his friend fills us in on the details. Picasso's child was taken by a monster named Yum Yum, and when they went to rescue him, they had a traumatic experience with the beast, and Picasso hasn't spoken since, choosing only to communicate through his drawings. Well, those symbols that he drew on the wall are going to be very important when we come to our next dungeon, so it's important that we write them down, or you can just follow the video because I'm going to show you which way to go. This guy is the village chief, and he lets us know that Yum Yum hasn't just been capturing children, but he's been eating them. 
He also believes that we're the prophesied Southpaw reliever that will come and save the village. After a pep talk from this guy, I feel like we're ready to fight Apollo Creed. Make your way out the southeast exit. It's time for our first dungeon. As you follow the path to the north, this caveman wants to make sure that we got the clue from Picasso, and this other caveman wants to make sure that we have the axe. We're good to go, so just make your way into the cave. Head on up into the first room. We have to take out some wild boars here. You may recall that they took two shots to kill with the rocks, but now that we have Tink's axe, they can be easily dispatched in a single hit. There's some more boars in this room, and there are also some new enemies, the purple lizards, which have two health, so they'll take two hits from your axe to kill. You don't have to defeat all of the enemies in this room, but if you do, it'll open up a secret passage where we can find a medicine. So once you kill the last lizard, head on back to the left, and you'll see that a new path has opened up. So head on up into there, and we'll be able to get a medicine. Medicine is one of the most useful items in the game. You can only use it from the pause menu, so you want to pause and press up. And whenever you use it, it'll restore up to five hearts of health. So that's a nice thing to have in your inventory. Although if you die, you'll lose your medicines, so make sure to use it anytime that your life is low. Make your way around this path and we'll reach a blue grizzly bear here. You don't have to kill him, he has five hit points. Just make your way around and avoid him. Come over this way and then come back up. You'll want to jump carefully onto this platform which will take you up to the higher platforms. And then you can make your way over to the left. You don't have to clear these boars to move forward, so just jump down and go through the door. In here there are three blue grizzly bears. You'll need to defeat all three grizzlies to move forward here, although you may notice there's an open door on the left side. That will just take you to a dead end. That's a room that's adjacent to where the medicine was that we found earlier. Head on up here and there's another new enemy, the snowman. They have three health and there are two ways you can go through this room. You can make your way past the snowman and go up and around, or you can try to make some tricky diagonal jumps across those platforms. The jumps are probably a bit more risky, so unless you're very comfortable with jumping diagonally, take out the snowman instead. In this room we'll encounter a gold grizzly which we can just avoid, but we have to fight all three of them here. Take out the one in the middle first and then take out the other two one at a time. The gold grizzlies have 8 health instead of 5, but they deal the same amount of damage that the blue ones do. Just stay far away from them and when they're defeated go up through the door, and this is where we need that clue that Picasso gave us. Remember it was circle, circle, triangle, square, circle, square, triangle. So there's the triangle, and if you go the wrong way, you'll come to an exit and you'll have to start the stage over. So here's the square, then circle, then square again, which is going to be down at the bottom. And the last instruction is triangle. So head on through there, and we will have reached a checkpoint. You don't have to fight any of the snowmen here, just move on to the next room. Just avoid these wild boars and head into the next room, where it's time to fight the boss. Yum Yum. Take a quick step to the right and head all the way to the top and start attacking Yum Yum rapidly from this position. You don't want to kill that boar he was going to eat because it'll distract him for a while, and you'll be able to get in a ton of free hits before he even thinks about attacking you. A few rapid strikes and Yum Yum will go down, and we'll be on to the end of the chapter. Wow, you've done it! As chapter 2 comes to a close, we enter the back of Yum Yum's cave. Here we find out that the missing children from the caveman village haven't been eaten at all. Yum Yum was trying to fatten them up so they would be even more delicious. They're lucky to be alive, but can finally return to their parents. That's not the only thing we find back here though. 
Way in the back of the cave, there's this strange Tetris piece. It's a T piece, although in 2019 there was a viral tweet that featured a Photoshop Tetris instruction manual that had hilarious names for the pieces. The tweet was a joke, but the game show Jeopardy thought it was for real. So for the rest of the guide, I'm going to refer to the pieces by their so-called official names. This one is a Tiwi. Well, it seems that we've returned safely to the present time, and we're getting another telepathic message from Micah. Maybe she knows what's going on with this weird Tetris piece we found. Ah yes, her father Hirokon has hidden the Tetrads somewhere on Earth in different time periods. So that's what we're going to be doing in this game. In each chapter, we're going to travel to a different time period. Within that time period, we'll need to find one of the mystic Tetrads. There are seven of them in total. And once we've found them all, we'll finally be able to unlock the secrets of the Argonians. In addition to being an item that we need to find to advance the plot, each Tetrad will also increase our maximum life total. Now that we know what we're looking for, we can turn the page in the Oxford Wonder World, say the magic words, and head off to another time period. You slip to another time and space. Chapter 3 is Ancient Egypt. Just like in the original game, Chapter 3 is the largest one. We have two dungeons to take on this time, as well as a large maze. Before we get to any of that though, we're going to walk north and you're going to see a pair of palm trees on the right side. If you walk between those palm trees, you'll find a secret passage, and on the other side there's a small hut. If you talk to the man inside the hut, he'll trade you a bronze dagger for our axe. The bronze dagger deals 50% more damage than the axe, and unlike the weapons in the original game, we don't need to have a certain number of red hearts to be able to use it. We'll be able to use that bronze dagger all of the time. Clearly we're in Egypt, and this is the barge of Cleopatra. Before we can actually talk to Cleopatra though, we need to talk to most of the people out here. You don't have to talk to the small girl or the cat, but you do need to talk to the other people. If you don't talk to them, they won't let you through to see the queen. Once you've spoken to all the people that are required, this guy will allow you through. And we won't be able to get any farther than this. Cleopatra can help us find the Tetrad that we're looking for, but in typical video game fashion, we're going to have to do something for her first. It seems that she ordered a pizza three days ago, and the delivery is taking a very long time, so we're going to have to go pick it up for her. Before we leave, we can chat with the people that we didn't talk to before, and this cat is very hungry. Now that we've spoken with the queen, the man up here will move out of our way when we talk to him. And we can head on through and enter Chapter 3's first dungeon. Now that we've arrived at the first dungeon in Chapter 3, we can see what that bronze dagger can do. These gray spiders only have two hit points, so it would take two hits to kill them regardless of which weapon we used. But this next enemy, the bandit, has 8 hit points, so it only takes 6 hits to kill him with the bronze dagger, while it would take 8 hits to finish him off with the axe. In this room, we can get a new sub-weapon, the slingshot. The slingshot only deals 1 damage, and for these enemies like the spiders, 1 damage or 1.5 is the same, so there is a nice advantage to using the slingshot against them because it has increased range. We're not going to want to use the slingshot against most of the other enemies in this dungeon though, so once you get out of this room, you may as well turn it off. You can take the long way around here, but if you're good at the diagonal jumps, there's a bit of a shortcut through those platforms. Up here we can fight some hedgehogs, 
The hedgehogs will start rolling towards you if you get in their line of sight, so you want to attack them diagonally at an angle. If they start rolling, they're invincible, and you'll have to wait until they hit the wall to start attacking them again. Against these bandits, I like to take out the middle one first, and then try to take out the other two one at a time. Having the bronze dagger here is a big advantage. These pink scorpions only have two hit points, and they can't shoot at you like the blue variety which we'll encounter later. They also can't jump over gaps, so if you attack them from across one, they won't be able to get you. Once they're all defeated, the wall will explode, and in this room there are some grass monsters, which are kind of hard to see, but they only have one hit point, so if you destroy them all, we'll open up a secret passage, and you'll be able to find a medicine. Once you return to this room, the grass monsters will have respawned, so be careful as you move to the room to the right. In here, we need to take out the hedgehogs. You don't have to actually kill the grass monsters here. Taking out the hedgehogs will open the door. Up here, there's another 3D room. Take out the spiders, and then go up onto this platform, which will lead you to the higher tier. From here, you can jump down to the bottom, and then you can climb up on that greenish platform, after taking out the scorpion, of course and then onto the bright yellow one, which will lead you to the top. Up here we have another multi-tiered room, and you don't have to actually kill the enemies in this one, although a few things you'll notice. If you jump down to a lower platform from a higher one, you can actually cover two spaces, and if you move diagonally, you can walk from one adjacent platform to another one. This is all good to know, and when you move up to the next room, it's time to fight the boss, the Scorpion Queen. You want to try to avoid the small pink scorpions in this room. If you destroy any of them, the queen will shoot at you, but if you just concentrate your attacks on her, she won't shoot at you at all, and will be easily defeated. Once the Scorpion Queen is gone, the door will open, and it'll be time to get that pizza. If we talk to this guy over on the right standing next to the camel, he'll allow us to rent that camel for free. I mean, I guess as long as you're searching for a pizza, it's free. This is a very confusing business model, and I don't think it's going to work out very well long term. In any case, once you're on the camel, we'll be treated to this cutscene. Pretty soon, we're going to find out why that pizza was taking so long to get delivered. Yeah, it's because the pizza man was riding on the back of a Koopa Troopa. It seems like it might be one of the giant-sized ones from World 4 of Super Mario Bros. 3. But in any case, you're definitely not going to be delivering pizzas very fast riding on the back of that thing. Now that we have the pizza, we can take it back to the Queen's Sail Barge on our much faster camel. Once we get back to the barge, what do we need to do to return the camel? Can we return it to any random camel location, or do we have to take it back to the one where we got it? I'm not sure of the details on all this. Somehow the pizza is still warm when you return it to Cleopatra, probably because the desert was hot anyway. Or maybe the box was really well insulated. At the bottom of the box, we see that it's from Caesar's Hut. For some reason, I misremembered it as Little Nero's, which I guess would also be a good joke. Now that the pizza's finished, she tells us to come closer, and we can see what Cleopatra actually looks like, and she looks very European. I'm sure that with all that time out in the sun, she would definitely have super pale skin like that. That totally makes sense. At this point, if you didn't already have the bronze dagger, she would give it to you here in exchange for the axe. But luckily, we picked it up already. From here, we could go down to the pyramid, but we won't be able to get in. There's a force field blocking our way, 
so instead we need to head north where we'll find a small strip of green river delta. This area is a maze and we need to follow that monkey. If you go up on these tall platforms you can see into the maze, but whenever you're walking through the tall grass you won't be able to see the walls. So you need to make your way to the left, then to the right and come down towards the platforms, and then head over to the area in the lower right. From here we want to head north, and then a bit to the left and we'll be able to enter this clearing where we'll enter an action scene. In this action scene, there's some one-eyed frogs. You don't have to kill any of them, just move on forward. And up in here, there are some swans that can actually spit projectiles at you, so be ready for that. The crocodile is the only enemy that you have to kill here, so take him out and it'll blow open the wall. In the next room, we can pick up a couple hearts. So if you're damaged, you can head over to the right side and grab those, but you don't have to take out any enemies here either. You just need to make your way to the left. Grab those hearts and hop on over to the left. Remember that you need to walk all the way to the edge of those platforms before you jump to the left, or you may not jump far enough. Kill all three flying jellyfish here and the wall will open up. You don't have to take out the hippo. And that will lead us to the next section of the maze. Back at the maze, you can see that in this section, there's a big heart for us to find. If you climb up on this platform, the path becomes obvious. You want to exit through the left there and then head up near that next platform, curve around it to the right, and then head back down to the bottom, where we'll be able to exit out of the maze and grab a big heart which will increase our life total by one unit. It'll also fill you up to full health if you were damaged. Once you have the big heart, head on back into the maze. This time we're going to go back the way we came, go all the way up to the top and head over to the left. Head over to the left at this juncture, then back down, around near that platform, and then back up and back to the left. We want to exit at this area, which will take us to yet another action scene. Much like in the previous action scene, we only need to take out the two crocodiles here, and the wall will open up. Head on up through there, and in the next room we need to do the same thing. You only need to kill the croc, and that will open up the wall. So take him out, and that wall will open up, and we'll be able to head on through. In here, we just need to move over to the left, and kill any of the frog enemies that you see. Once you take out the frogs, the wall will open up. And in this room, we just need to walk through. You don't have to actually kill anything. Just take out any enemies that are in your way and follow the path around. Up here, you need to jump to the left or the right side, and then you'll be able to move up through the door at the top. And that's it. We've completed another action scene, and we're back to the maze. This is the third and final section of the maze. We're still hot on the trail of that monkey, so head on into the left and you can climb up on these platforms if you need to survey the area. The key here is to make it to the lower left corner. So that's where we want to head to, just follow your way going left and down when you can. And when you get near this platform, this is where you want to start heading up again and keep going left until you get there, and then go straight up towards that ladder, then back across to the left, then back over to the right again, and then down towards the platform a bit, and back up and to the right. And from here, we're almost to the end, so just exit to the right, and make your way up and right until you come on out at the top. Once you get through the maze, the monkey will give us our first magic. The special ability that he needs to give us is the power of the mind. So we now have the Psychic Shockwave. Don't get too excited about the Psychic Shockwave. It actually deals less damage than our Bronze Dagger, but it does fire a lot more quickly.
Outside the pyramid, we'll meet a snake that says he was charmed by a catchy tune inside, as well as a man that says we'll need something special to pass through the barrier. That something special, of course, is the psychic shockwave. Once we're through it, in the next room we'll meet some skull bugs, they have four hit points, so you'll notice that they can be dispatched a bit more quickly with our bronze dagger, although the psychic shockwave does fire faster. In here we'll meet some cobras, which have five hit points, and they're surprisingly similar to the snakes in the original game. This room has a lot of traps. Watch this. You'll fall through a pit if you stand on that space, and it'll take you back down to the snake room below. Instead, you want to wait for this fire to die down, and then jump across that space. If you want to get the hearts, make sure to wait for the fire to die out, but we don't need them right now. Instead, we want to hit that trigger switch at the top, jump across, and then jump down to hit the switch. There's no fire down in the lower part. Make your way across into the next room. These green zombie enemies have six hit points, and you'll notice that they can't be damaged with your bronze dagger. You have to use the psychic shockwave. They'll also charge at you if you get into their line of sight, so attacking them at an angle is a good way to deal with them. The mini mummies only have two hit points, but the max mummies have nine, and they also deal more damage if they hit you. These platforms will disappear after you stand on them for too long, so don't linger on any of those yellow square platforms. Carefully make your way past the mini mummies and head on down into the next room. In here we'll face a birdman enemy which has 12 health and can fire projectiles at you. Your best bet to beating that guy is to attack it at an angle. Jump into the middle of this room and you want to hold to the left and you'll be able to collect these hearts. And you want to avoid that steel ball and walk around the middle of the room there. There's a pit that will drop you down farther. And just make your way through the door on the right. These arrows will push you in whichever direction they're pointing. And we'll need to use our psychic shockwave to defeat that zombie. You'll need to do a few jumps or just hold to the right to get through the door. These skeleton enemies can be stunned, but never truly killed. Whenever you shoot one, it'll collapse into a pile of bones, but after a short time, the bones will reanimate, and you can actually be damaged if you touch the bone pile. Over here on this ledge, there are two switch tiles. One reveals two hearts for you to pick up, and the other will populate the question mark, which one touched will trigger the wall to blow up. Over here in the next room, there's some max mummies, and there's also one of those try your luck signs. The try your luck sign can give you extra lives, but it can also take them away. In my experience, it usually does add lives to your total, so it's probably worth the risk. Head on up through the north door, and in this room we have to fight two birdman enemies. Try to attack them at an angle, and try to kill them one at a time. Whenever there's two in the room, they're much more dangerous. Once they're defeated, the wall will blow open, and we'll be entering this room filled with spiky traps and green spiders. The green spiders have three hit points, and you'll need to kill all of them before the door will open. So just follow along the arrow tiles and take out the spiders along the edges. Head on up through the door, and in this room there's some more of those skull bugs, and there's a switch tile you can jump on if you need to find a few hearts. It's this one right here. Once the skull bugs are destroyed, the wall on the left will open up, and in here there's two of those mini mummies, as well as two more of those zombies which we can only defeat with our psychic shockwave. Quickly take them out and head through the door up above. In this room with the snake-shaped tile pattern, you want to jump on the tile at the end of the snake's tail, which will trigger a question mark that will open the wall. And in this room, we'll need to take out two max mummies to open up another wall on the right side. Stay away from the area between the tiles in this room. 
fires will pop up there, and you're much safer fighting the Birdman just staying out of those spaces. Up here at the top, we can trigger a medicine to appear, which is nice. And down in this room, this is what we were looking for. We need to hit this switch tile, which will give us the question mark to open the treasure chest. And inside, we'll find the flute. The flute is a magic item that we can use from the pause menu. And when we head through the wall on the left, we're back in this room with the skull bugs. You'll notice that those hearts repopulated whenever you hit that tile. And unlike most hearts or medicines in this game, you can keep going back to this room and collecting the hearts again and again. They will infinitely respawn, so make sure you have full health before you move on here. Once again, you can take out the mini mummies and the zombies to open the door. And when you get into the next room with the snake-shaped tile pattern, that's where we're going to use the flute. Pretty tough puzzle. So use the pause activate the flute, and three cobras will come out of the wall. Whenever you kill off the three cobras, a secret passage will open, and we'll be able to move on deeper into the pyramid. Remember that the cobras will charge at you if you get into their line of sight, so it's always best to attack them at an angle diagonally. In this room, there is a mini and max mummy to fight, and when you jump onto that yellow platform, remember that we need to jump onto the next one quickly because it'll disappear out from under us. If you want the hearts, jump up and then jump back over to the land on the right side. Then repeat the platform jumps heading down this time and then across to the left. You don't want to linger on this platform too long because it will disappear out from under you. And over here we can grab another medicine, which will be very helpful because in the next room, it's time to fight the boss, the Monster Mask. Quickly move to the top of the room while rapidly attacking and standing on the sixth tile from the left. Then you just want to stay slightly off center from Monster Mask and keep on attacking it. If you get right in front of it, it can deal you massive damage. So you always want to stand at least one step to the left or one step to the right while you're attacking Monster Mask. And it's really that simple. We've made it to the end of Chapter 3 and have found the Pyramid's Treasure Room. Inside, we'll find our second Tetrad, the J-shaped piece, officially known as an Orange Ricky. With the Orange Ricky in our possession, our life level is increased and we can return to modern times. And that's it. It's time to move on to Chapter 4. Once again, we open up the Oxford Wonder World and turn the page. We say the magic words. Where will we go this time? Or rather, when? We're about to find out. In Chapter 4, we're going to encounter a fictional character from the world of literature, and that's one of the reasons why I think that we're not actually time-traveling, we're just going into a world based on the information in this book. In any case, we've arrived in old-timey London at 221B Baker Street. We can't go past this lamppost until we enter the building, where of course we'll run into world-famous detective Sherlock Holmes. He's even depicted here smoking a pipe, which is something you totally wouldn't see in a modern game. Well, he's concluded that a robbery is going down at the museum tonight, although he doesn't explain at all how he knows that. What he does do is name drop Zoda, so of course Mike is interested. Once we're done talking to Holmes, we need to get to the museum, and we're going to take a very roundabout way to get there. We can say hello to this fellow dog, and if you want to, you can stop in this building where we can wake up someone who is sleeping. This guy is not very happy to see us. The only way to get to the museum, it seems, is to talk to a police officer who will arrest us and put us in jail. Yeah, I'm sure that makes a lot of sense, but that's what we gotta do. I mean, we are wearing 1990s clothes in old-timey London, so we do look pretty weird. And we're up very late at night going to the museum, so, I mean, it is a little bit suspicious. 
This guy says that the jail is escape proof, but that is totally false. The guard is asleep, and there's a secret passage in the wall on the right. Once you've escaped the jail, head up and then to the left, follow the path along, and you'll have to cut through this building on the left. On the other side of the building, we can say hello to this sleepwalking guy, and then just make your way up to the ginormous museum building. It is way larger than the other buildings in London, and does seem a little bit out of proportion. And hey, we got here before Zoda. Maybe we're the ones that are going to steal the Tetrad. Nope, nope, there he is. So did we get here too late, or was Zoda waiting here the entire time because he wanted us to see him take the stone? Zoda does have a little flair for the dramatic. Well, the game is afoot. We need to give Zoda chase, but before we do that, head over to the left and go down into the sewers, where we'll find a big heart. This one's actually very easy to miss, so don't skip over it before you head down the ladder. Once you have the big heart, make your way over to the right and then head down. There's another ladder that will take us down into the first dungeon. There's some tricky platforming in this dungeon. Normally when you walk up to the edge near the water, you won't naturally walk off. But whenever you're on this wooden raft, if you simply step off the edge of it, you'll fall into the water and die. So be very careful when you're jumping from that raft onto the mainland. In this room, there's a shortcut that you can take. Head over to the right, and what the game wants you to do is go up onto that second tier and take the door up above, which will wrap you around and take you the long way through this room. But instead, we're going to jump down to the platform below and take a few diagonal jumps, and then jump from the upper left corner of this platform up onto the second tier, where we can trigger the door and head over to the left. If you want to get a medicine though, we can take this path up above. Trigger the tile over here, and then hit that question mark to open the wall above. I don't actually recommend that you get the medicine here. The boss in this dungeon is more likely to kill you when you fall into the water and instantly die, so your health is not as important as it is in other zones. These enemies are called Giant Radis, and they have 12 hit points. You'll need to kill both of them before the wall will open up and you'll be able to get that medicine. They are very similar to the grizzly bears or the bandit enemies from the previous chapters. Once you get the medicine, remember that all the enemies will respawn, and we need to go back to that room with the jellyfish where we took the shortcut, because that's the way that we actually need to go. We need to hit that tile on the lower tier there, and open the door on the left. In this room, you simply need to go down, but you want to watch out that you don't get hit by these small radis enemies that will appear right in front of you whenever you move from screen to screen. Take out any radis enemies in your way. It's good to attack them at an angle when you're near the corners. Do the same thing down here. Attack any radises. It's useful to attack them at the corners sometimes. And then head on up and through the door on the left. In here, there's some more of those arrow tiles, so be aware of them. You can definitely fall off the end, so be careful not to do that. It would be instant death. Jump on up into this room. You need to be jumping or up on the second tier to damage these owl enemies, because they're flying. If you attack them from the ground, you won't hit them. So make sure that you're either jumping or standing up on that higher tier. And this is the boss, the Zoda Brain. You want to attack it about three times each time you're on one of these platforms and then jump over to the next one. And whenever you're on that bottom platform, don't attack it at all. Simply jump down off the bottom and restart the cycle. You don't have a lot of time whenever you're on that bottom one so you can definitely get messed up by that. And once the Zoda Brain is defeated, go all the way around the tiles and out the bottom one, and hit the switch, and you'll be able to exit through the door. And that's it. 
we finished the first dungeon of chapter 4. But we're not done yet. It's time to chase Zoda. There are no mazes or hidden heart containers here. Just a straightforward path to the next dungeon. Follow it along and you'll see Zoda's footprints, which lead on through the door and take us into the next part of chapter 4. There's some hearts over here on the left side, but this room stretches out to the right farther than you may expect. If you die in this dungeon, you may come back with less than full health, and this is a good way to get all your hearts filled up before you move forward. Once you're all ready to go, head on through the door at the top of the room, and we are going to encounter some of those red Zoda spawns, very similar to the ones that we fought at the end of the first game. These ones can jump across water, which is very annoying, and they have three hit points, so they're actually pretty dangerous. In that treasure chest, we'll find the Spike Disc Weapon, which is one of the best weapons in the entire game. It deals three damage, so definitely make sure to take advantage of these when you can. Kill the two big Raddus and go through the bottom door. With those spike discs, we'll easily be able to take out any enemies in our way. You have to kill all of the owls to open up the secret room below, where you can get a medicine. Once you have the medicine, head on back into this room. And what we actually needed to do here was hit that switch up on the higher tier, and that will open the door to the left. In this room, we'll need to be very careful to jump from the platforms to the rafts. Jump to this raft as it's moving towards you, and don't forget you can easily walk off the side of those raft platforms. You definitely don't want to end up in the water. This platform will disappear quickly after you jump to it, so make your way across these and then down to the bottom where you can exit through the door. This green enemy is called an alien bug and it has 5 hit points. Watch out for the spread attack that it shoots. Once you make it to this room, you've hit a checkpoint, so if you die, this is where you'll come back. These blobs have three health, and they're a little bit annoying because whenever they're in the air, you won't be able to hit them when you're on the ground. In this room, you can hit that switch, and you'll open up the wall below. And in here, we can find another medicine. Now, when we were in the previous room, we didn't want to walk between those tiles because when you do, you'll fall into a pit. If you go in the pit in the upper right, we can get another medicine. We have to kill these three Zoda spawns to be able to open the door back up, but we can collect the medicine and then take the path upward, which will eventually lead us back to the room with the three pits. Before we get there though, we are going to have to go through a room with a bunch of blobs, so if you don't feel like you need the medicine, you can skip it, but there is a difficult boss at the end here, so you may want to pick it up. Hit this switch tile in the lower right, and then we'll be able to open up the wall, which will lead us back to that room with the three pits. The way to move forward here is to take the pit in the middle of the room. There's a doorway at the bottom, and there's a bunch of Raddus enemies in here, which once we kill them off, we'll be able to open up a wall and move forward. Take out this last Raddus, and we'll be able to head through the wall on the right side. There's some more of those alien bugs in here. Watch out for their spread attack, and hit them at an angle with your bronze dagger. Now we've made it to another platforming challenge. Carefully make your way down here if you want to pick up a try your luck sign. Jump back up onto the raft and ride it over to the right, where we'll need to jump onto another raft. And then we'll jump onto a third raft that's moving vertically. And from there we can head up onto those tiles in the upper right corner. One of them will open up the treasure chest, and we'll be able to get those spike disc weapons, which we definitely want for the boss here. Wait here for the raft to come before you jump onto that platform, because remember, it's going to disappear shortly after you jump onto it. 
and ride the raft over to the left, which will take you to this room filled with Zoda spawns. Now, you can open the door using that tile there, but if you kill the Zoda spawns, we can open up another secret room over here on the right. In this one, we can get yet another medicine. Make sure to pick this up before you head on to the boss. Once you have it, make your way back over to the left. And you already know how to open up the door here. You just need to hit that tile in the lower left corner. Hit that question mark and switch over to those spike discs because it's time to fight Zoda X. Zoda X always appears in the lower left or the lower middle first, so we can take advantage of knowing that and try to deal him a lot of damage right off the bat. After that, we want to jump a lot so that we don't have to deal as much with the arrow tiles on the floor. And you cannot shoot through the fire attack, so don't even try. You can try to shoot in an angle whenever he does the fire. But the other attack that he does is to shoot an array of skulls at you. That's a lot more easy to avoid, you can just jump over it. And as long as you just keep up the attack with the spike discs, Zoda X will go down quickly. It's kind of interesting that he does the dinosaur form right before he dies. And that's it! We've killed Zoda! So did we beat the game? Well, of course you know the answer is no. But we did find another Tetrad. This one is officially known as the Rhode Island Z. And they must do things backwards in Rhode Island because that is more of an S than a Z. But that's what it's called in the official instruction manual for the NES version of Tetris, so who am I to argue with it? Our life level is increased, and up here we can have one final conversation with Sherlock, who deduces that if there's a Zoda X, that there must also be a Zoda Y and a Zoda Z. Yeah, because, you know, aliens understand our phonetic alphabet, and they're just creating a nice neat pattern for us. And what about the other letters? Why couldn't there be a Zoda G? Well, in any case, it's time to use the Oxford Wonder World again and take another travel through time. Yeehaw, partner! Chapter 5 is the 1849 California Gold Rush. We appear in a western-themed area surrounded by cacti. We'll need to make our way up north to the mining town. Chapter 5 is one of the most flavorful ones in the game with lots of fun characters and little things to find. Once we get in here, we can talk to this miner, who lets us know that there's gold in them thar hills. Everyone seems very excited, and if we head to the top part of town, we can have a little conversation with the man in charge. Whenever we tell this guy about our tetrads that we're looking for, he seems to know a bit about them. Although he does call it a tetot rad, he said that it was buried in a mine that was covered by a landslide. We'll need to figure out how to open up the way. But before we do that, if we wander to the very top of town, we can find some funny tombstones. This stuff's all optional, but I like that they included it. Here lies Daring Dave, a landslide sent him to an early grave. And here lies Lucky Larry, his luck ran out and now he's buried. I like that they include little stuff like that, it's kind of fun. If we talk to this guy, he seems to say some nonsense about approaching a cactus from the south, but that's actually an important clue that will come back later. Before we move on though, we're going to need some dynamite to be able to open up those mines, so we need to head over to Bob's store. I'm not sure if Bob understands how stores work, but he gives us the dynamite for free. Alright man, well... If we strike the gold, he'll buy it from us. Seems like we maybe owe him a bit for the dynamite, but, you know, that's, I guess, how the system works around here. Now, if you head straight to the left from town, and then head down a few spaces, you'll see this yellow line. 
you want to go way below that and bomb the area between these two rocks. In there, we'll find a big heart. It's not exactly the mine that we were looking for, but we definitely want to grab the big heart first. Unfortunately, we can only carry one load of dynamite at a time, but the good news is that old Bob at the general store will give away free dynamite to anybody that asks him for it. So we just need to stop back over there and he'll give us another load. There's only one other thing that we actually need to find here in Chapter 5, and that's the entrance to the mine where the Tetrad is hidden. But if you want to blast a bunch of holes in that wall over on the left side, there are a number of other things that you can find. The first thing that you can find, of course, is a gold nugget. So just head straight to the left from town and place a bomb right there. Whenever we enter this mine, we will find a gold nugget and strike it rich. Now what do you do with a gold nugget? Well, you can take it back to Bob's store. Bob will give you a little over a thousand points for each gold nugget you find. The points are meaningless, but there are four gold nuggets out there in the wall if you really want to look for them. There is one other thing that you might find out there though. If you set a bomb near this yellow strip, it'll look like we found a gold nugget. Same thing that happened before, but this one is actually a chicken nugget. It's delicious, but nothing happens. Well, we certainly don't need to find any gold nuggets or chicken nuggets to be able to advance the game, so let's stop back at Bob's store and get a load of dynamite, and then do a little bit more investigating so we can figure out where that buried mine is. Let's talk to this miner up here. Well, it seems that he struck it rich, and he wants us to meet him at the saloon. Uh-huh, that could be a good place to check. Of course, there's a bar fight going on, and Mike may only be a junior in high school, but they are definitely serving him at this bar. They give him a shot of sarsaparilla, and over here, this guy has what he calls red-eye ginger ale, which I'm pretty sure is spiked with something. But the guy we really need to talk to is the piano player. He does a song called The Cactus Dance, and this is a very important clue that will tell us how to find that missing mine. Alright, so let's see what he says to do. We need to find a special cactus, and then take two steps left, then three steps right, then turn left again and walk to the wall. That's why that guy that we talked to earlier told us that we need to approach cactuses from the south. That'll make sure that we're in the right position to do the cactus dance. Armed with this information, all we need to do now is find that special cactus. So we're going to head out of the mining town and see what we can find. Make your way to the left. There's a lot of cacti out here, but there's only one with the arm drooping downwards on the right side. Approach it from the south. Two steps to the left. Go three to the right, then turn left and walk to the wall. That's the cactus dance. We'll put a load of dynamite on there, and this will take us into the passage that will lead to the first dungeon of Chapter 5. Make your way through the path and up into the door. The first dungeon in Chapter 5 is not very difficult. In the first room, we'll encounter some blue scorpions that have three hit points and can shoot at you, so you want to attack them at an angle. The path that leads up there is a dead end, so you want to head through the door on the left. These Cactus Man enemies explode in four directions when you kill them, but you don't actually have to. Just smash through the wall in the top of the room and you'll find a staircase leading up. In this room, there are some boulder traps. You can actually kill the boulders with your Psychic Shockwave, but it takes a decent number of hits and there's a good chance you'll be damaged when you try to do it. So just avoid them and make your way into this room where you'll fight some purple cobras. 
They have six hit points and are fairly similar to the orange variety that we encountered in Egypt. There's some hearts in that room, but the way to go is to drop through the middle of that platform. And over here, this is the room that was on the other side of the first room. That's the dead end over there on the left that we didn't go into. In this room, we want to jump up and take out the scorpion on the right side. Watch out for the one that shoots from the left. Then you can drop down and remove these two cobras. Whenever you hit this switch, you will find the question mark that will open the door below. But make sure to be careful of that scorpion whenever you're going up there to collect it. In this room, we'll fight some dirty chests. Whenever you hit them with your bronze dagger, they will explode and turn into dirty coins. Those only have two health, but they move very fast, so you'll want to take them out as quickly as you can. Inside the real chest, we'll find the bolas, which are a weapon from the previous game. They have a lot more range than our bronze dagger, so we'll want to use those on the boss, which is in the next room to the left. But if we kill all three Cactus Man enemies in this room, we can open up a hidden passage, which will lead us to a medicine. So that could be handy to have whenever we fight the boss, but don't forget that those Cactus Man guys are going to be back when you enter the room. Head through the door on the left, and we're going to switch to our Bolas. They have much better range than our Bronze Dagger, so that'll allow us to stay pretty far away from this enemy. This boss is known as the Rock Cyclops, and this is what you want to do to fight him. Just keep a decent space between you and him, and keep throwing them at his face. You'll need to jump over the boulders when he rolls them towards you, but the most important thing is to kill him before he gets too close. If you come into contact with the boss himself, that is instant death. So you want to make sure to finish him off before he gets all the way over to the right. Once he's gone, jump on these platforms and you'll be able to head through the door at the top of the room, which will take us out into the next area. This is another straightforward corridor that's going to lead us directly to the next dungeon. But before we get there, we are going to have a short conversation with a friendly mule. Pretty weird, I'm not gonna lie. He gives us an upgrade to our Psychic Shockwave, and now we'll be able to deal more damage with it, and it'll shoot farther, which is nice. The only problem is you need to have at least 5 red hearts to use it, or you'll be downgraded to the regular Psychic Shockwave. If you need some hearts though, you can hit that tile down in the lower part of the room and find two of them. And in this room, let's try out that Super Psychic Shockwave. We can jump and attack these scorpions, and you'll notice right away the enhanced range that it has. It goes a lot farther than our Bronze Dagger, and it deals the same amount of damage, so we're going to want to use the Super Psychic Shockwave whenever we can. Make sure to quickly jump off of those arrow tiles as soon as you enter this room. You want to collect that medicine, but you can just go right through this room and then quickly jump off to the left in the third room. If you take out these three blue scorpions, you'll open up the wall on the right side, and you'll notice that if you had followed those arrow tiles, you'll end up in a small dead end which will return you to the beginning of the area. Down here we can go through the secret passage that we opened up, and inside we'll find some hearts, and of course, a medicine. Once you have that medicine, make your way back out of the door and head downwards. That will take you around the corner, and we can move on to the next part of the area. Interesting thing, if you fight these dirty chests with your Super Psychic Shockwave, or the regular Psychic Shockwave for that matter, they won't turn into the dirty coins, and they'll be a lot more easy to defeat. Each one has four and a half hit points, so three shots of your Super Psychic Shockwave should take them out. In this room, we can blast through the wall and get another medicine, and we're going to encounter more of those boulders here, and you can see how the Super Psychic Shockwave can actually kill them. You need to be careful though, whenever you kill a boulder, another one will immediately spawn from the right side, so it may actually be better to just try to avoid them. You definitely want to get this chest. That star will grant you invincibility whenever you use it from the pause menu. Invincibility is quite good in this game, so make your way through that door, and there are four Cactus Man enemies to take out here. Remember, whenever they flash, that means they're going to explode, 
so just stay out of their way whenever that happens, and you should be able to clear these guys fairly easily. In the next room, we're going to have to fight a mini-boss. This guy's called the Mine Rider, so let's try out that Invincibility Star. It lasts for about 10 seconds, and so we can get up in here and just rapidly attack this guy as fast as we can. You can use your Bronze Dagger or the Super Psychic Shockwave. Don't use the standard Shockwave. And once you're through, this is a checkpoint. So if you die and lose a life, but don't lose all of your lives, this is where you'll come back to. Take out those blue scorpions and the door will open on the left side. And in here, we're going to encounter some minor ghoul enemies, but we don't need to use a reflecting mirror to kill these ones. They only have one hit point and you can mostly just avoid them. Hit that tile on the far left to open the door and make your way up into this room. In here, there are three purple cobras, and as you may have expected, if you kill them off, you can actually open up the wall on the right side. In here, there's another treasure chest, and there's also a conspicuous crack in the ceiling. So if you hop up there and attack it, you can enter another secret room. This one gets you the medicine, although the star that we found in the previous room is probably the more important of the two items. Head on up through the path at the top of the room here. We're almost at the boss now, but there's a few more traps to navigate. If you just walk on the sides of this room, you won't be able to get hit by the wall stakes here, but they're a bit trickier in this room. You'll need to wait until they retract, and then you'll be able to pass to the space right before the next one. And in this one, you want to wait, then hesitate there for a second, and then move on up into the next room, where we'll face the Masher Miner. You want to rapidly attack him with your Super Psychic Shockwave as soon as you get in the room, and whenever he mashes the ground with his big hammer, that's your cue to turn on the Big Star. The big star will make us invincible for 10 seconds, so during that invincibility, you want to get up in his face and hit him with as many psychic shockwave shots as you can. Once it wears off though, you want to step back a bit and try to finish him with the last few shots. It's not that difficult to beat him if you have the big star. And with that, we've completed chapter 5. It's time to find another Tetrad. There's not much to see here in this area. Just head on up and pick up the very important line piece, which is known as Hero in the Tetris instruction manual for the NES. And yeah, it does feel like a hero when that thing shows up and allows you to finally make that Tetris. And with that, we're going to open the Oxford Wonder World again and say the magic words. Where will we travel to this time? Chapter 6 is actually one of the shortest chapters in the game, and also one of the easiest. There's only one dungeon here for us to go through, and that dungeon doesn't even have a boss at the end. After we complete the dungeon, there will just be a simple maze that we have to get through, and we'll have the Tetrad that we seek. This is the Italian Renaissance. There are a lot of fun characters here in the Renaissance. It's not mandatory that you talk to any of them but we can go around and see what they have to say. This guy doesn't know much about tetrads, but certainly thinks it sounds like a strange pasta shape. And this guy is clearly making a joke about the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, although he lets us know that he sold the map to Leonardo's house to some big weird guy. Could it be Zoda? Over here we meet the Pizza Man from Caesar's Hut, I think that when we encountered him, we were several hundred years into the past, so unless he's some kind of immortal vampire, I don't think that we're actually time traveling here, we're more just going into a world created based on the information in that book. Over here, we can meet a woman in a back alley that gives us a plate of pasta. Very suspicious, but it doesn't seem like it has any negative effect on us. And down here, we'll find the only open door in the area. 
and there are some footprints that clearly belong to Zoda. Someone's inside this statue, so to get him out, we'll need to head down these stairs and into the first dungeon. This dungeon is a weird one. There are no enemies in here that you'll kill in the traditional way. Everything is more of just a trap. Navigate these steel balls carefully and make your way to the door on the right side. And in this next room, you want to wait for this heavy ball to drop and then pass underneath it as it retracts upward. In the next room, we'll encounter more of those moving platforms. Treat these ones the same as the rafts that we encountered in Chapter 4. If you're not careful and you walk off the edge of that moving platform, you will drop right into the pit and instantly die. Make sure to hold to the right whenever you jump over these blue spiked fences. If you just jump straight up, the platform will go out from under you and you'll fall into the pit below. Jump over these the same way, make sure to hold right when you're jumping, but you want to let go of right whenever you land on the platform because you can accidentally just walk off the edge. If you grab the medicine, you'll have to repeat the platforming challenge above, but once you have it, you'll just want to make your way through the door on the right. In this room, you need to get all of the balls to go into the hole in the ground. And the way to do that is whenever you hit them, they'll change direction from moving vertically to moving horizontally and vice versa. If you stand right here near the hole, you should be able to easily guide that one in. But this room's a bit more complicated. Stay along the bottom here, that's the easiest way to get past those balls. And you want to come right up to this position so that you can shoot that ball into the hole. If you miss it, you'll need to correct and shoot it again but you should be able to take out those two fairly quickly, and that will make it easier to take out the next three. This one can be shot in. You may want to jump after you shoot it in case it comes in your direction. And you want to put this one on this exact line and then move it onto this line where it could be easily tapped right into the hole. The final ball is the most difficult one. You want to pull it into this position between those two yellow barriers and then get it onto that line where you can shoot it into this position right next to the hole and then just tap it right in. And that's actually the last room in this dungeon. You can just make your way out the top and we'll find a hammer and chisel which we can use to rescue the guy that's trapped inside the statue. The chisel is in the top of the room, so make sure to grab it first. And then you'll head down and pick up the hammer. Once you have both tools, you'll be able to chip the famous master out of his statue. And of course we all know who it is. It's Leonardo da Vinci. Chip, chip. Tap, tap. And there he is. Da Vinci himself. It seems that the great master had a close encounter of the fourth kind when he had a run-in with Zoda Y. How we know it was Zoda Y and not Zoda of some other letter, I have no idea. But the good news is that Leonardo has a lead on the Tetrad we're looking for. Before we go, he asks for our opinion on the Mona Lisa. And when we tell him that we don't like the hairstyle, he changes it to something a bit more radical. He also has a gift for us. A new weapon. Marco Polo's katana. The katana deals one more damage than our bronze dagger, so we'll be very happy to have it. It's also one of the most powerful weapons in the game. The only ones that are more powerful than it are temporary sub-weapons. Leonardo mentions an invention that he has, and it seems to be a crazy flying machine. While we're taking flight, we do get a telepathic message from Micah, and she lets us know that something bad has been going on on Sea Island. It seems that the aliens have arrived, and they hypnotized Dr. J, and then found out how to time slip. I didn't even think that Dr. J was in Sea Island right now. Well, in any case, it seems like we may be heading into a trap. 
But before we go, we stop on this strange island. There are no dungeons on this island, but if you head over here onto the left side, you can find a secret passage through this wall where we can get a big heart and increase our life energy. Once you have the big heart, make your way back the way that you came and go back into the flying machine where we can move on to our next destination. Once again, we take flight, sputter, sputter, cough, cough, and once we land this time, this is where the maze is. So make your way around and enter the castle. Much like the snow field in chapter two, there are a bunch of hidden pits you can fall into here that you'll want to avoid. Stay along the lower wall here and then walk all the way across following this wall and then dropping down to the bottom and then go all the way across and stay on the right side. After you go through the stairs, stay along the right wall here and then cut all the way across to the left and follow the left wall for a bit. Take that left wall all the way to this intersection and then continue to the left. In this narrow corridor, we are going to hit a pit that we can't avoid. Once you drop into it, it's time to play an action scene. Just hit the switch tile in the lower right corner, touch that question mark, and you'll open up the wall at the top of the room and be back into the maze. Follow it down into the stairs, and in this room you want to take two steps left, one step down, and then follow to the left until you get to the stairs and step up into them. In here, we're going to hit another action scene that we can't avoid, and this one's very important because depending on which door we go through, that's going to determine where we come out on the map. So make sure to take the door at the top of the room. Watch out for this skull that spits bones at you, and just make your way over to the stairs. If you take one of the other doors, you'll end up on a different path, and the two paths on the left and the right are dead ends. We're almost to the Tetrad, you want to go straight up here, go to the fourth mask and take one step down, then head over right to that statue, and just stay close to it, and you'll be able to grab the next Tetrad, known as the Cleveland Z. I guess that Cleveland understands how letters work, because unlike the Rhode Island Z, this one is an actual Z. Micah had warned us that this was going to happen. It seems that the aliens had been setting a trap, and now we stand face to face with Zoda Y. This time we won't be heading into the Oxford Wonder World to go to the next chapter. Instead, Zoda is going to teleport us to a place that he wants us to go. He laughs, but really the joke's on you, Zoda, because the place that you sent us to is a legitimate chapter where we'll be able to find another Tetrad. Yeah, nice trap. Chapter 7 is Transylvania, and unlike many of the other chapters in the game, we're not going to meet any historical figures. We won't run into Vlad the Impaler or anything like that. This one is very straightforward. There's just one big dungeon in here to do. So just follow the path along to the castle. Now, while there's only one dungeon here, that doesn't mean that it's going to be an easy one. This is one of the more challenging dungeons in the game. We have full health right now, but if you've been in this dungeon before and died, you're probably going to want to collect a bunch of hearts here at the beginning, so if you head over to the left, there's another set of two hearts here you can pick up. The shortest way to go is to take the path up here, but if you want to get another medicine, we have to go all the way to the right instead. So this path is optional. If you already have full health and you feel confident, you don't need to come up here and get the medicine. But in this room, if you take out these three bats, which are called Noctos, you should be able to open the door and we'll be able to collect that medicine. The Noctos have three health, so our Katana, which deals two and a half damage, is just barely not enough to kill them in a single shot. Once you have it, this is where you would come to if you had taken that path up at the very beginning. Here we have to fight some Frankensteins. 
I know that technically this is Frankenstein's monster, but that's what these guys are called. Whenever you hit it for the first time, it will separate and just be two legs that'll move quickly. So you want to try to not have multiple sets of legs running around, just kill the Frankensteins one at a time. In this room, if you wait for a moment, a bunch of ghosts will appear, and you can only damage the pink ghost. The pink ghost has 13 health, so once you finish it off, it'll kill all the others, and it'll open up this room where there's a medicine, but don't try to collect the medicine too quickly because there is a fire trap nearby. In this room, we need to clear the ghosts again, wait for them to appear, and look for the pink one. These work sort of like the ghosts in the graveyard of Legend of Zelda. You can only damage the master ghost, and when it's destroyed, you'll be able to clear all the other ones automatically. Once again, we have some of those zombies to fight here. They can only be damaged by the psychic shockwave, so make sure you have that equipped. This tombstone ghost is very similar to the Dark Nuts in Legend of Zelda. You can't damage it when you're attacking it from the front. You have to make sure that you hit the tombstone on its back. Watch out for the projectiles that it shoots at you. You can jump over those. He has 13 health. So once he's cleared, you want to be careful when you go through this room that you make sure to get the treasure chest on the right side, so do a few jumps to avoid being pulled into the center by the arrow tiles. And here you'll notice you can continue to fall through the ground several times in a loop. We want to break the loop by moving to the right on the very second room there, so the one right after the first one that you dropped through and you will find a try your luck sign in there, and then you can head over to this room where there's more of those blue Noctos. We did collect the three-way shot, which is the most powerful weapon in the entire game. If you use it against the Noctos, you can kill them in a single hit because it deals three damage. The three-way shots are something you'll be able to pick up more of later on in the dungeon, so don't worry about using them up. You could try them against this enemy, which is called the Bride of Frankenstein, but it's easy enough to kill him with your katana. Just make sure to jump over the sparks. And you can see how effective the three-way shot is against the Noctos in this room. There's a crack on the back wall here, so if you attack it, you'll open up a secret passage where we can find a medicine. And remember that you can't actually kill the skeleton enemies whenever you hit them. They'll collapse into a pile of bones but that pile of bones can still damage you and it will reanimate after a moment. In here, we don't have to actually kill the Frankensteins, so you can just try to get around them or just hit the ones that are in your way, because we only need to hit that switch tile, then touch the question mark to enter this room. In here, we'll face a new enemy, the Sorcerer. The Sorcerer has a good bit of health, it has 20 hit points, and you wanna be careful not to shoot the crystal balls that it drops or they'll come flying towards you. In here we have a few more of those zombies, so make sure to attack them with your Psychic Shockwave. They're fairly easy to take out now that we have the Super Psychic Shockwave. Once they're all killed, you can head over to the left, and in this room we'll find a Medicine and a 3-way shot. You need to remove both Frankensteins though before the platform will appear that will allow you to collect them. Remember that whenever you step on that platform, it will disappear after a moment, so make sure to wait for it to disappear and reappear before you go onto it again. In this room with the zombies, there is actually a switch that we need to touch. It's in the upper right corner, and that's going to open up the door and take us to the next room. You can't actually kill the skeletons in here, so you only need to kill the Noctos to open the door. And in this room, we have another Bride of Frankenstein to fight with a lot of gaps in the floor this time. Stay far away and attack with your three-way shot. You should be able to clear her fairly easily. Head on up into the next room. We are very close to the boss now. And if you touch this tile down in the lower right, we can open up a medicine. And there's actually another switch tile in the upper left that will get you a few more hearts. And get ready, because this is the boss, Zoda Y. This boss has two forms, so I like to attack the first form with the katana. 
If you stand slightly off center, the boss's shots won't hit you and you'll just have to deal with those bats. Whenever he appears on one of the sides, the next time he'll appear in the middle and he'll continue to alternate like that. So if he appears towards the middle, the next time he'll appear on one of the sides and then he'll appear in the middle again. Just continue to stand slightly off center when you're attacking him and the first form will be dispatched very easily. When Zoda Y turns into the Owl form, you want to switch over to your three-way shots. The three-way shots will help control the bats, and they'll also deal a lot of damage to the boss. Get your hits in whenever you can, and whenever it does the wing flapping attack, you want to try to jump over the feathers and stay out of the spikes at the back of the room. But you want to be extra careful that you don't accidentally jump into one of the pits around the room, because that's instant death. We have several medicines right now if we take damage, but if you fall into a pit, there's no recovery from that. Once Soda Y is defeated, the door will open up and a platform will emerge from the ground. And we've done it. We've completed Chapter 7. In the back here, we'll find our next Tetrad. This is the square piece, which is officially known as Smash Boy. I can't make this up, it's really called Smash Boy. With Smash Boy in our possession, our life level is increased, and we can finally return to the present. Now it seems sort of strange to me that after we received that message from Micah, that the aliens know how to time travel now, they've attacked Sea Island, they hypnotized Dr. J, that maybe we should be taking care of the problems in the present first before we jump back into the Oxford Wonder World, but it seems like we're ignoring all of that and moving on to Chapter 8. Chapter 8 returns us to a more traditional Star Tropics 2 experience. We're going to be traveling to a new time period. There is a village to visit here with people to meet, a historical figure to speak with, and of course, two dungeons for us to fight through, each one ending in a boss. This guy says some weird stuff. Odds Bodkins? I wonder where we're at. Well, this night will confirm it. We are definitely in Camelot, and it seems that it's being attacked by a dragon. Sir Lancelot over here says that he would fight the dragon, but he's like really busy or something. Yeah, that just sounds like an excuse there, Lancelot. But don't worry, we're going to take care of the dragon. This woman tells us that we should see King Arthur at once. Well, of course that's what we expected would find here. That's a little bit of a throwback to Chapter 5 where the two guys were brawling in the bar. And Sir Spineless the Cowardly definitely isn't going to try to fight that dragon. Follow the path around upwards, and we will enter the throne room. King Arthur is flanked by a pair of guards, and if you talk to one of them, he says he's been standing still all day and could really use a coffee break. King Arthur lets us know that Merlin the Magician said that we were going to be expected. You may have encountered Merlin several times already in this game if you died. He's the wizard that appears on the game over screen. We tell Arthur that we're willing to fight the dragon, and he dubs us Sir Mike. Whenever we become knighted, we actually gain a level of life. Pretty nice. Arthur is the only person that you actually have to talk to in the castle and once you've spoken to him, you can exit, and you'll be able to move up north past this purple knight that's blocking the way. There's nothing more to be found here, so just follow the path north, and enter the first dungeon. This dungeon is much shorter than the one that we just went through. In this room, there are three blue blobs to kill. They have three health each, but after you kill the first two, make sure you're in the upper middle when you kill the third one, because you'll immediately be sucked through the floor, and you want to land on that platform so that you can hit the switch and pick up the medicine, or move on to the next room, whichever you want to do. 
These skull enemies are technically called bone spitters, and you don't have to kill them to be able to get out of this one. Up here we'll be able to hit a switch so that we can go back into the blob room, and we want to finish it the same way that we did before. Take out the first two, and make sure that you're standing in the upper middle when you kill the third one. This time though, instead of trying to get the medicine, which won't be there anymore, you want to just head through the door at the top of the room. Be careful where you kill the skeletons, remember that the pile of bones can still damage you, and up here we'll be able to get another medicine. Make your way back the way that you came, you can jump diagonally to get around the bones, and you want to go around these cow skulls to the upper left. In this room, we just want to go around the Bride of Frankenstein, try not to get hit by the sparks, and when we come through this way, these skeletons are actually a bit easier to avoid because there's more space on the platforms here. So just jump on up, and before you take out this Bride of Frankenstein, you may have noticed that there was a medicine down here, so you'll want to grab that and then come up here and fight the Bride. This is another one of those situations where you're going to be sucked through the floor whenever you kill the enemy, so you want to be in this general area when you take him out. Head on up into this room. In here we encounter some new enemies called Silver Knights. They have 13 health and they will occasionally shoot projectiles at you whenever they flash, so just be ready for that, you can jump over them. In this room you want to move quickly through the arrow tiles so you can get past those spikes, and you want to take the upper path, then the lower path here. This time we want the lower path, then the upper path. And in the last one of these rooms we want the lower path, then the middle. And at the very end here we can pick up four hearts in case you were damaged, because it's time to fight the boss, the Knight Rider. That sure doesn't look like David Hasselhoff. You want to come to this spot right here, about four arrow tiles near the door, and whenever you see the knight turn around, that's your cue to hold up and start attacking. Do not try to attack this guy diagonally. It looks like that's what's happening here, but I'm actually holding up. If you want to attack him from the top, you need to hold down. If you try to attack him diagonally, your shots will always miss. So make sure you're holding up when you're attacking from the bottom, or down when you're attacking from the top, and you shouldn't have a lot of trouble defeating the Knight Rider. Like in many of the other chapters, there's a short cave here that connects one dungeon to the next one, but before we actually go into the next dungeon, we're going to finally meet with Merlin. Or maybe we've actually met with him already. It seems that he's been appearing to us in different animal disguises. Now, they don't say this explicitly, but in the instruction manual, it says that Dr. J got the Oxford Wonder World from a wise old man. And I have to speculate that it was probably Merlin, perhaps in a different disguise. He tells us that we need to find the final tetrad, and he gives us the most powerful magic attack, the Ultra Psychic Shockwave. The Ultra Psychic Shockwave requires 10 red hearts to use, and it deals a little bit less damage than our katana, but the amount of range it has is amazing. This thing shoots clear across the screen, it is by far one of our best attacks. These purple Noctos only have 3 health and are essentially the same as the blue variety, but if you kill them all, it'll open up a secret passage on the left side, where we can get some 3-way shots, as well as a medicine. Once you have those, there's actually another switch tile in this room in the lower left corner, and whenever you hit the question mark, You'll be able to head through the top of the room, where you'll find another treasure room, and in this one we can grab a second medicine. Pretty nice. Head back the way that you came, and when you go back into the room with the purple Noctos, you simply want to take the door at the top of the room, although if you took some damage while you were trying to get the medicines, you may want to collect the hearts now. These enemies are called Rockers, 
and whenever you kill them, they'll flash orange and then shoot in eight directions. So try to take them out at far range and you should be fine. This giant blob has 16 hit points, and whenever you kill it, it'll split into three smaller blobs. If you leave the giant blob on the screen for too long though, it will start to shoot at you, so you want to clear it as quickly as possible. This orange monster is called a Zotasaur, and you can jump over the projectiles it shoots, but it can only shoot in the four cardinal directions, so if you attack it diagonally in an angle, you should have no problem taking it out. There are three silver knights in this room. Try to stay far away from them as you attack with your ultra psychic shockwave, and jump to avoid the projectiles if they get too close. In this next room we hit a checkpoint, and using our three way shot we can quickly take out these blob enemies, and open up the path through the top of the room. There are two of those giant blobs in here. You want to attack them one at a time so you don't have a ton of the smaller blobs bouncing around, but this time you may have to deal with the fact that the giant blobs can actually shoot at you. Once they are all defeated, the door will open, and we will be able to move on, but if you want to grab some hearts real quick, there is a switch tile in the lower left of that array. Over here in this room, there are three of those rocker enemies. Remember when they turn orange, they're about to shoot in eight directions, so either get away from them at that time or be ready to jump. Make sure to get over those spikes, and in this room you want to wait until the platform is close before you walk onto that orange one, because it will disappear out from under you. You should be able to get these hearts fairly easily, and then you want to hit the switch tile up near the door. Afterwards, you'll have to get back onto this platform, jump over the spike fence, remember that you have to hold to the right whenever you jump over it or you'll fall, and be careful not to walk off the edge of the moving platform. It works just the same as the rafts we encountered in Chapter 4. There's another new enemy type here, the Gold Knight. These have the same 13 hit points that the Silver Knights do and can also shoot at you in the same way. But much like the Tombstone Ghost or the Dark Nuts in Legend of Zelda, you can't damage this guy from the front. So you have to hit it either from the side or the back. It can be kind of tricky, try to keep him at range. And once they're both cleared, the door will open and we'll be able to move into the next room. Now these balls are very similar to the ones we found in Da Vinci's basement. So if you shoot them between two rows of blocks, they'll be frozen there because they want to move vertically. So be strategic as to where you stop those balls and you should be able to easily collect the hearts and trigger the switch which will open the door. In this room you want to hurry up and hit that switch panel so that you can blow open the wall. In here there's a secret passage where we can grab a medicine, but don't be too hasty. You want to avoid the fire traps before you pick up that medicine. Back in this room we want to hit a switch tile here in the upper left corner which will populate the question mark that opens the door. And in this room we can find two arrays of four hearts if we need them. The way we need to go is over to the right, but if we want to get a medicine we can take the path to the left. The only price for getting this medicine is we have to kill this orange Zotasaur. And with all the space we have in this room, we should have no problem attacking it at an angle and quickly finishing it off. Make sure not to forget the medicine and then head back through the door. If you didn't pick up the hearts in this room before, they will repopulate, but if you did collect them, they won't be there the second time. In this room, there are two Zotasaurs that we can fight. You'll want to take them out one at a time. That one got me. We don't have to actually kill the Zotasaurs to move forward here, but they're going to open a secret passage on the right side that has a lot of good stuff. Before you go through there though, make sure to hit the switch and open the wall at the top. That's the way we're going to need to go later, and you might as well do it while the Zotasaurs aren't there. If you stay on the tiles on the outside here, you won't get hit by the fire, but you will need to move in a bit to be able to get the medicine. Hit this switch tile in the upper right and it'll open up the wall on the right side. 
and in here we will find some more three-way shots, which will definitely be handy when we get to the boss. If you have died and you don't have any three-way shots right now, it's even more important that you pick up that pack of them. Once you have the three-way shots and the medicine from this room, make your way back to the room with the two Zotasaurs. And if you followed my advice and opened up the top of the room, it'll be easy to move on. You'll need to jump here to take out these bone spitters or just get up onto that second tier. Once they're removed, the door will open. And over here, we'll have to fight two of those gold knight enemies, which is quite a dangerous combination. You'll want to attack them at a distance with your Ultra Psychic Shockwave, and remember that you can't hit them from the front. If you don't have the Ultra Psychic Shockwave online, you may want to use a medicine to make sure that you have the 10 red hearts required to use it, so that you can really attack these guys from far away. In the next room, there are four of those rocker enemies. Continue to use your Ultra Psychic Shockwave here, and you can find some arrays of hearts by triggering the tile in the lower left, which could help you keep that Ultra Psychic Shockwave online. Once they're all defeated, the room will open on the left, and in here we have two Silver Knights and one Gold Knight to fight. I would take out the Silver Knight first since they're easier, and then we can focus on the Gold Knight. He's a good bit more dangerous because you can't attack him from the front, but it's not too hard to clear him out. In this room, there's a medicine for us to find and two more of those giant blobs. We have a lot of those three-way attacks, so we might as well use them against the giant blobs here to make this room a bit easier. We are almost at the boss. Once they are all cleared, the door will open up, and make sure not to forget that medicine before you move on to the next room. This is it. This is the dragon. You need to jump to shoot the dragon in the face unless it's ducking down to spit fire. Whenever it does duck down to spit fire, you want to take a step to the right. It always shoots the fire in the center first, followed by the left side. So if you take a step to the right, that will make it easier to avoid. Whenever it's throwing fireballs like that, do your best to avoid them. And if your Ultra Psychic Shockwave goes offline, you're going to need to use medicine to replenish your health or just switch over to those three-way shots. If you attack it slightly right of the center of the dragon, you should have no problem avoiding its attacks, and the three-way shots should easily finish the job. Once the dragon is defeated, we can head on out of the dungeon and enter the final room of Chapter 8. And there it is, the final Tetrad. This one is the L-shaped piece, also known as the Blue Ricky. Once you have the Blue Ricky, our life total will be increased to full. Now all we need to do is figure out how to put those Tetrads together. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem like Mike Jones is much of a Tetris expert though, so he may need to ask for help from someone else. Once you have the Blue Ricky, Make your way outside of the dungeon, and we will return to the present. Back in good old 1994, we get another telepathic message from Micah. She must have been a little bit too subtle last time, because it doesn't seem like Mike really got it. This time she really hammers the point home. We need help at Sea Island. And then it appears that the Oxford Wonderworld can actually transport us to another place in the present. Is there anything that this magic book doesn't do? It reminds me a little bit of Penny's computer book from the old Inspector Gadget cartoon that always seemed to be able to do whatever she needed it to. Chapter 9 is the final chapter. This is it. And it's a throwback to the original game. We appear on Sea Island, and I think they programmed the entire thing, although you can't access very much of it. All you want to do is make your way to the town of Korokola, where we will be able to enter the Sea Island Tunnel. Everyone in Korokola has been turned into a wild boar, 
And there's a trick I'm going to show you in the final dungeon to skip the final boss. If you want to do that, you want to talk to this fisherman guy from the left side, right after one of the boar's moves. And then you want to hurry on into the stairway immediately after you're done talking to him. That'll help set up the trick. If you just want to finish the game normally, none of that stuff is important. This is the game's final dungeon, and I really like what Nintendo did here. They brought the two games full circle and recreated the first level of the original game using the engine from Star Tropics 2. In here, you only have to kill the blob that started in the lower left corner to open the door. And in this room, you don't actually have to kill any of these Raditz enemies. They have three hit points and are fairly easy to get rid of, so just take out whatever ones are in your way. And jump across these tiles. You want to make sure that you're holding left so you get a full jump each time. And the switch tile is over there on the far left, which will create the question mark that will open the door. In here, you only have to kill the Raditz enemies. You don't have to kill the Nocto to be able to open up the door. We can grab some three-way shots in here and you'll trigger the door tile at the bottom and there's also some hearts up at the top if you need them. There's a pink cobra here that has six health and if you're familiar with this room from the original game, you know that there's a big treasure room over on the right side. So that's where we're going to head. Blow up the wall using that switch and over here we can grab a medicine. But of course that's not the only treasure here. If you jump on the switch tile in the lower left, you'll open up the top of the room, and in here you'll have to take a bit of damage from spikes, but it's a worthwhile deal to be able to get a try your luck sign and another medicine. Make your way back down, there's no instant death trap room this time, and you'll want to come back to the left of this room. This time we want to open up the door at the top of the room, which will take us on to the final room before the boss. So just hit the question mark down here and go up through the door. In the next room, you only have to kill the bats. That will open the door. And in the next room, we'll fight the first boss here, which is the zombie sea serpent. And there's actually a way to skip this boss. Watch this. This trick is not too difficult to perform and I'm going to show it in slow motion. You just get on that left platform and get into the upper right corner of it. As soon as you get hit, you jump diagonally upright, and when you stop flashing red in mid-air, you need to tap right. That part is very important. If you mess that up, you'll fall in the water and die. Now, the regular method, use your three-way shot and stand in this position to get a few hits in early, and then go over to the left platform and attack him from this position. If you jump back to the middle platform, the serpent will certainly open up in a place where you'll be able to hit him from the left platform again. So just wait until he opens his mouth, then get back to the left platform, attack with your three-way shots, and very quickly this guy will be defeated. He's not that difficult. But that's only the first boss here. Oh, we are far from done. We've made it to the checkpoint here, but the rest of this dungeon is a boss gauntlet. Make sure to get these three-way shots here, and also grab this first medicine. We're going to take the arrow tiles at the bottom so that we can collect this medicine, and as soon as we get to the next screen we need to start jumping so we don't miss the second medicine down here. Come on down to the bottom, and we can jump around here aggressively to be able to get both of these medicines. This is going to be good. We may need all these medicines because we're going to have to fight a whole bunch of bosses up ahead, so do not miss out on your opportunity to get these. In this room, there are two more medicines, and there are spikes that are closing off the room, which seems bad, but if you actually just jump back, you won't be able to go far into the previous room, but you will be able to reset the spikes. Then you can just jump across them safely and head on up through the door where you will be sucked through the floor and into the first room of the boss gauntlet. The bosses are a bit more difficult this time, but we're armed with the Ultra Psychic Shockwave. 
For Yum Yum, you want to take one step to the right and start attacking rapidly. And as soon as he gets into the right corner, you should be able to finish him off with some diagonal shots. You can jump over the bubbles that he shoots, but from those two positions, you should be able to kill Yum Yum quite quickly. He doesn't sit there and munch on a boar this time, though. Now we're going to do something different against the Scorpion Queen. You want to kill two of those scorpions and stand here right in front of the door. That will cause the queen to shoot at you, but her shots will miss, and you'll be able to score just a ton of free hits. It's a lot different than the previous time when we were just trying to avoid the scorpions. In here, you want to take one step left and rapidly attack Monster Mask. You'll get a bunch of free hits in, and sometimes you can even kill the boss this way. Otherwise, make sure to stay slightly off-center as you attack it, and this one should go down fast. The next boss is Zoda X, and he's one of the toughest ones in this boss gauntlet. Switch over to your three-way shots, and remember that he always appears in the lower left or the lower middle first, and you can score a bunch of hits on him early. Then do your best to avoid his attacks. Remember that you cannot shoot through the fire attack, but you can get a lot of hits in whenever he does that wave of skulls. If he does the fire, just try to get away from it and attack him as many times as you can. That was actually a really good set of attacks. And you should be able to finish him off fairly quickly. If you shoot close with a three-way shot, you may be able to even score multiple hits, which can finish him even faster. Head on up through this room and we're going to be facing the Masher Miner again. Remember to quickly attack as soon as you enter the room to get in a bunch of free hits with your Ultra Psychic Shockwave. And you need to avoid the rocks, so try to navigate around them and attack the miner from as much of a distance as you can. He actually moves very quickly, so you don't want to collide with the boss. In the next room, this is where we're going to do the final boss skip trick if you want to attempt it. This one's a little bit harder than the sea serpent skip that we did before. The first thing we need to do against Zoda Y if we want to do the skip is to kill the first form of the boss, and we want to make sure that we kill it when it's in the middle somewhere. Remember that Zoda Y will always appear on one of the sides, then the middle, then one of the sides again. He alternates between the two. He can start anywhere at the beginning, but after that he always commits to that pattern. So if he's on one of the sides, just wait for him to disappear and reappear again to make sure you can kill him in the middle. And then we're going to do the most difficult part of the trick, which is this void jump. If you can do that, you can get over to the other side. Now I'm going to show that in slow motion so I can explain what we did, but let me show you the rest of the trick here. If you take a bunch of damage and don't have the Ultra Psychic Shockwave, you should use some medicine until you have it again, and just keep attacking from this left side until the boss is defeated. And once he dies, you want to get into the far left corner, right in this spot. When you drop down, you're going to hold to the left and then make a diagonal move and then go down a little bit. And that will take you outside. And this is the end of the game. We've completely skipped the last two bosses of the boss gauntlet. So here it is in slow motion. You go to the top of the screen, down and take damage. Then you do two big jumps up and turn to the side and shoot. Then you're going to hold pause. Hold it in until the game actually pauses. Then you're going to unpause and hold up and jump. And as soon as you jump, you hold pause again. And then when you unpause, you should hit the boss. Make sure you do it right in front of the boss. And if you do everything completely correctly, you'll be able to get over that long gap and make it to the other side. The rest of the trick is easy. You just have to kill the boss and get into the lower left corner so that when you drop through the floor, you end up in an out of bounds area which will allow you to screen wrap to the left. So just walk to the left, then walk down left diagonal and slightly down and you should find your way out. Never jump whenever you're down in that screen with the dragon or you could cause the game to crash. Now here's the regular way to fight Zoda Y in the boss gauntlet. Remember to always stand slightly off center when you're attacking him and his shots won't be able to hit you. You can also try to get him when he's on the sides from a diagonal. And now we're going to fight the owl form, but we're not on the other side anymore. 
so just try to keep up the heat with a bunch of psychic shockwave shots. Stay far away, and remember to be careful whenever you're jumping to avoid hitting the spikes in the back of the room, that you don't accidentally jump into the dark space where you'll fall in and it'll be instant death. We were able to collect a lot of medicines before the boss gauntlet, so don't be afraid to use those if you need them. It's always better to refill your health and keep your Ultra Psychic Shockwave online than to have to try to do some other stuff to make up for it. The next boss is the dragon, so I am going to use a few medicines before I go down there. We're going to fight him the same way. You want to stand slightly to the right of the dragon when you're attacking him. And he always shoots the fire to the middle first, then the left, then the right. And when he gets to the bottom of the screen, he's going to do that flying attack where he drops a bunch of fire on you. And it's fairly hard to avoid. If you need to use your three-way shots against this guy, those are also very effective. You won't really need them on the final boss, which is the next one that we're about to fight, so feel free to use them up here if you need to. It is always nice to have those available though, if you want to have them for fighting Zoda Z. Once the dragon is defeated, we're going to head out through the door. Don't use any medicines here because we're going to get an item called Vitamin X, which will refill us to full health. So save your medicines for the final boss. We're about to get a full refill here. The question mark will open the door and the Vitamin X will fill us up to full. This is it. This is the final boss, Zoda Z. You can only attack the light pink Zoda spawn and the other ones will definitely get in the way. Those guys can deal a lot of damage if they get on top of you and start hitting you, so you need to be careful here. Once the pink one is defeated, the boss will be formed and you want to stand right in this position and start attacking. He's going to shoot at you, but he won't hit you and your shots will hit him instead. Now you need to just try to avoid him and attack him with the Ultra Psychic Shockwave. But you want to watch out for that attack which shoots the large orbs. If you get hit by that, it won't deal you damage, but it will turn you into a wild boar temporarily, and you will not be able to attack the boss. This is only the first form of the boss, so once he starts exploding, get into position to attack him, so you can get some free hits as soon as the final form appears. This one does a lot of the same stuff that the first form did, but he has a few new tricks also. There are three other attacks that this Zoda can do, and he got me with the wild boar thing, so now you can see what that looks like. You can still jump while you're a wild boar, you just can't attack. This attack is difficult to avoid. He makes some lightning bolts come down, and then they explode with like crackling fireworks. Whenever he punches the ground, two flames will appear. You just want to get out of the way of those because they will move quickly horizontally. With this one, you're just trying to avoid the lightning bolts and jump over the electrical bursts. And the last attack that he does is he'll start spinning around and he'll become invincible temporarily and he'll just try to ram his body into you. So here it is. I wanted to make sure you got to see that attack. You just want to stay away from him while he's doing this. This one's not too hard to avoid. And whenever it starts winding down, you should have a good chance at attacking him. And that's it. Zoda Z has been defeated, and we have completed Star Tropics 2. Sorry, Zoda. You won't be getting any revenge today. So just hop on up and out of this dungeon. And in this room, we will find the missing alien children, including our friend Micah. It doesn't look like Zoda was fattening them up to eat them, so that's good. But they're still happy that we saved them. They want to make sure that the people of Korokola are okay. And so if we head over to the left, this dungeon will fade out, and we'll be back in Korokola. As soon as you speak with the chief, the ending will begin. So if you want to talk to any of your friends from Coral Cola, you need to do that before you go in there. You remember Miss Coral? It seems like she might be into Mike now, especially after he rescued everybody. 
this guy actually enjoyed being a wild boar. And if you remember the first game, you know if you talk to this pig, it'll turn around and shake its butt at you. And you can still do that in Star Tropics too. This woman's going to roast that pig for our victory, and she thinks that we're some kind of barbarian for liking our meat rare. I don't know about eating pork rare, I don't think that's a good idea. This guy wants to know how to use the Ultra Psychic Shockwave. And in here we can talk to Micah, who has some nice things to say to us. But to finish the game, we need to go and talk to the chief. You remember this guy. He gave us our first yo-yo in the original game. He says that he's quite good at Tetris. So let's see what he can do with those Tetrads. Once you talk to the chief, the control is pretty much out of your hands now. All we can do is sit back, relax, and enjoy the cheesy ending. Get that Rhode Island Z in there. The best piece, the hero. Then the Cleveland Z over on the right side. And now it's time for Smash Boy. Get in there, Smash Boy. And the last piece, of course, is Blue Ricky. With all the Tetrads combined, they begin to flash. And standing before us is Hirokon, the leader of the Argonians and Micah's father. We thought this guy was dead. Hirokon had his essence transferred to the Tetrads and now everyone is safe and they can return to Argonia and rebuild their society. Sadly, they don't even offer to let us come and check out Argonia. I think that as the hero that saved the entire planet, we might want to, you know, visit it at least once. But that's it. The Argonians teleport out, and Mike watches their essence fade into the horizon. Roll credits. And so ends the entire Star Tropics series. Before we go though, I do want to talk a little bit about what I would like to have seen in a sequel. I'd love to see someone like WayForward or Intercreates or any of those companies come out and actually make a Star Tropics 3 or some kind of Star Tropics reboot. And the kind of game that I'm envisioning is one that has more of an open world feel to it. It should still have retro graphics, either 8-bit or a 16-bit style, but there would just be a very large ocean that we can explore in the subsea, and there would be tons of islands where we can go in and there would be dungeons or action scenes and would find new weapons, new abilities for the sub, the ability to dive or teleport or maybe to shoot things with it. If anyone out there wants to make this game, feel free to steal my idea. I just think that if they made the overworld lean a little bit more in the Zelda direction, that that kind of game would just be amazing. So please, steal my idea, shut up and take my money. I would love to see a Star Tropics 3 someday. Somebody out there make it happen. Well, I hope this video was able to help you finally beat Zoda's Revenge and restore the alien civilization of Argonia. If it did, make sure to give it a like and make sure to subscribe for more videos because there will always be more evil alien overlords to overthrow. And that's why we'll be back again next week with another video game you can beat. Thanks for watching.